Welcome to the very first stream of McStabber Studios. This episode's called The Story So Far. We're going to go over as a prologue to everything that went on in D.C. before, you know, the official table stream starts. It's going to be a, a little bit of info, some funny stories. Um, I'd like to thank anyone who's, of course, in the chat. Thank you. Uh, hopefully at the end, if it hasn't taken too long, I will get a little time to talk to people and uh, maybe come up with, you know, some things that, you know, if y'all got questions, answers that the rest of them didn't answer, you know, they can answer it. That's why we have everybody in, of course, the channel. Give me one second and we'll fix this and then we'll be ready to go. There we go. So, hello, Locke. See, we got Kelidor. Of course, Relindaire is Lily. One thing before I start I want to bring up is uh, I've talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people seem to have storyteller questions about, you know, if as a new storyteller or as a, uh, an older storyteller trying to find tips and tricks on how to improve. Uh, I'm looking at doing a stream probably next Friday at about 11 p.m. Eastern time. Well, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, behind the scenes as the storyteller, how I converted DC by night into a V5 edition, which was difficult. And also, you know, some of the, the little things I do to, to handle, you know, all the players and everybody in the, in the game. Because generally there's, you know, there's a lot of little bits that most people don't, don't pick up in the beginning. But let us begin. So where does it begin? We can't start at the very beginning because we don't need to hear everyone's mortal life. But what we can start with is the oldest of the coterie, Lily. Lily was born in the 30s. Her actual name was Lily Sanger. Her, she had a normal uneventful life at first until her fiancé died in the Korean War. After that, she just started going to poetry and music places, normally coffee houses and those kind of places to listen to, you know, at the time, a little bit more of the beatnik scene. So what she decided was at one point to move to San Francisco to look for work off to the West Coast. And it was on the West Coast that everything changed. It was there. She was embraced by a Torador, a member of Prince Vannevar's court. His name was Gabriel. and He was a good sire for her for the brief time they had together. Well, brief in kindred terms. Eventually, somebody came and killed her sire. And when Vannevar refused to find the murderer or, and do anything about it, Lily realized that the court was no place for her. She had to leave. So she left. She went to LA, where she felt she could party a bit, maybe get some information on, you know, opening a club sometime in the future. And it was in L.A. She met Locke. So Locke, we should have talked about her first. Locke was born in the 70s, much younger than Lily. She's one of the youngest in the coterie. She had a family that was had some issues. Father was an alcoholic. Mother was a waitress. But when she was 10, a very important event happened, though at the time, she did not realize it was that important. While basically chaperoning her sister and wandering off to give her sister a little bit of free time with her boyfriend, she came across a wolf trapped in the woods. She did what she felt was right. She released the wolf. Little did she know, in the end, that would prove momentous. At 15, she ran away. Learned the hard lessons many runaways do on the streets. She got into gangs, some drugs, generally had a hard life then. And just when she thought she could turn it all around and she'd started straightening things up, fate stepped in. One night, her and a couple of friends were on their way home, and they were shot in a drive-by shooting. As Locke lay there, her last breath expiring, a woman's voice said that she owed her a debt from many years ago and would repay it by saving her life. That debt was the owner of the wolf 
a gangrel, though Locke did not know her sire's name for quite some time. Being left for a year in the old style made da Locke not really have any mentor at first. She ended up leaving outside of D.C. and in the suburbs, where she met a rather important individual that we'll leave for a later discussion, probably in the same little prologue. But he, after teaching her the ways of being a kindred, told her it was not a safe place to be in D.C., Vitel having recently been killed by Theo Bell, and told her that she should head out west to get away from it for a bit before the inevitable war with the Sabbat started. So off she went. And it was one night in the asylum, a famous club among kindred, that Locke ran into Lily. In some ways, Locke found Lily because Lily was leaving and some people were following her intent on doing harm and Locke, being Locke, would have no part of that. And she intervened in Lily's behalf. For Lily's a Torador without much in the way of fighting ability. Hers is more of the artistic lean. And ever since then, they've been together in one way or another, either, you know, working on clubs or working, you know, security, or Locke's very good with the local gang population, you might say. And it was at this point that Lily decided she needed an investigator. She needed somebody to look into her background because she had remembered things that her sire had mentioned about being descended from Helena herself, the great Torador, the one who started the original Succubus Club. So she was put in contact by Gary Goldman, of all people, with Quartermain, local Nosferatu. It's quite interesting for Quartermain. We'll talk about him a bit. Quartermain was born in the 50s to a family of law enforcement, if you'd believe it. He was drafted into Vietnam. Wasn't very good with guns. Wasn't very good at that part. But they did find out he had a particular knack for tracking and finding people that didn't want to be found, especially when they were in holes and dug in places. So he found him a role in recon, where he didn't shoot much, but he spent a lot of time digging out the enemy. When he got out, the war had changed him a little, but he decided to put all the tricks he learned to use, and he became a private detective. Pretty good one. Things were looking great for him until the cancer struck. Of course, there's always something like that. So when the can cancer struck, he was not going to give up. He knew it was fatal. Didn't care. He was going to do continue to do his jobs until the final job. He was hired to investigate a missing girl. And it led him to the CNO canals in D.C., where he went in looking. And while in there, he saw a very abnormal rat movements and decided to follow them. That was the, the fatal choice for Cordomain as a human. He followed the rats and was led to a room with a very hideous man who apologized for what was about to happen but said he owed a boon to someone and the boon was going to be repaid. But on the plus side, Cordomain wouldn't have to worry about cancer. Never knowing his sire, his sire had left right away, was needed somewhere else. Nathan, he was not a primogen, but the lead Nosferatu in the area, became a mentor. Taught Quartermain a bit, explained to him that the girl he was looking for was already dead. Razor, a Malkavian of some ill repute, had killed her. But before Quartermain could hunt her down, or hunt Razor down and find him. Unfortunately, Vitel was killed. And Nathan did not want Quartermain there, even though clan before sect normally applies to the Nosferatu. He felt a newly embraced kindred isn't going to be safe in a city full of Sabbat, Camarillian fighting, Anarchs taking control. So he had gone to L.A. And he was the one Lily hired to find her ancestor, Helena. The details of how he found her, we can't really discuss too much, mainly because they don't remember. They know they found her. They know Helena gave Lily permission to open a succubus club. Maybe it was malevolent forethought. Maybe it was, you know, she was feeling generous, but for whatever reason, she let her open a succubus club and then wiped all memory of how they find her 
where she was, who she was. So they are left only knowing that she could open the club, but not who the person was who did it other than Helena. So it was at this point, all of them in LA, they were there for a while. One night, Lily came to Victor Temple's club. Yes, the Victor Temple. Not yet undisputed Baron of the Valley, but close. Came to his club one night, Lily decided, I need to learn about how to operate a club. He runs a successful kindred-based club. How can I do it? Victor, for this kind of information, wanted a boon. He needed help. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second. This portion of our story was not run by me as storyteller. This portion of our story was run by one B. Dave Walters. He ran this as a one-shot off of his Patreon with me as a player in my own Chronicle, it was a memoriam of our current coterie. So I got to be a player in my own chronicle with a guest storyteller. By the way, if you get a chance to donate to B. Dave's Patreon, do it. It's so much fun playing when he runs games because most of the Patreon tiers have games he'll run for you. It's amazing. We all loved it. We had a great time. So going back to this one, Victor needed a boon. Victor had heard rumors that Tara. Yes, the terror that supposedly had been thrown from a building somehow had come back, and he needed it investigated. So, he asked Lily as the boon. Of course, Locke was going to tag along because Locke was very interested in a woman that had been hanging out at Victor's Club, one Lilith, who spoke to her of the Dark Mother and the path to fulfillment. Along with him, of course, went Quartermain as a favor to Gary, and two others, an odd Malkavian named Dr. Samuel Ludlow, who was also in a coterie with a man who called himself Jimmy Page, no relation. The odd part is the Jimmy Page, no relation. He looked a lot like Jimmy Page, could not sing, but that was the name he went. The full details of that, we don't need to cover now. But suffice it to say, they did capture Terra. Ludlow was taken in the jaws of a lupine to the beach. Jasper took Terra. Yes, Jasper. And took him away somewhere. Just to point out, this is not canon to L.A. by night. It is canon to the B-Day verse. It was at this point, Locke got a very odd phone call that she's never quite fully explained to the Coterie. Rudy, the Rudy, called her and told her to get out of L.A., take her friends, and leave immediately. A blood hunt had been called by Vannevar for the terror instance. So off they went to D.C., Lily, Locke, and Quartermain. Jimmy Page stayed behind because his sire was still there, and... Jimmy had an unusual relationship with his sire. He felt he could possibly be protected. So, at this point, they returned to D.C., knowing that Vitell had returned. Now, for those who had heard of Vitell's untimely demise, he did die. But as the Beckett's diary said, he did come back. And when he came back, he decided to set up D.C., as a free state, not an anarch free state, but a true free state, where Sabat, Camarilla, Anarch, and Independence were welcome to be free from the jihad. How well that worked out, we shall see. But when they met Vitel, he saw the obvious benefit of a succubus club opening in D.C., so he granted the coterie some very substantial holdings right in a very nice part of town, DuPont Circle so that they could set up this succubus club. And while it was being built, Quartermain the Nosferatu once again returned to where he was embraced, had a strange pull under DuPont Circle, and in the process found him a pre-built haven, stocked with a library of occult books, well secured, hidden away. He just felt natural that he should take that as his own, which is a side note, he had spent the Zelios lore sheet. You've got to put an explanation somewhere. 
So at this point, while the club's getting built, Quartermain reestablished his relations with Nathan, the spy master now of DC. He fed all the info to Lord Vitell. And as all Nosferatus, he traded in secrets information. And Nathan and Quartermain had a good trading relationship. It wasn't until opening night, actually right before opening night, another odd thing happened. A day or two, Vitell called a meeting with the coterie and only the coterie. They did not. He did not say why. But when they met up, there was a man with him, a vampire, a kindred, called himself Steve Perry. And though they did not know it at the time, they find out later. They knew this Steve Perry, knew him from a previous time. He was Steve Perry, no relation. I guess for those that aren't the kindred, you can guess who he was before. He was a Kaitif told at Vitell's request to join the coterie. And while initially they thought, is he a spy? Is he tricking? Is he going to work for Vitell? Who is he going to work for? In time, they somewhat grew to trust him, though the man he was then, or the kindred he was then, and the kindred he has become, is totally different. He's progressed quite a bit. And then, on opening night, two days before, while investigating some issues with a th uh, poacher, Quartermain found a very large, abnormally large dow watching Lily and her club. And in some miraculous stealth and a bit of unseen passage, managed to not only sneak up but completely surprise the owl. The owl turned out to be a gangrel named Malik. And he had a message. He had come to kill Lily Sanger. You see, he is the one who killed her sire. In retaliation for her sire killing his, he had decreed he will eliminate all of Gabriel's children and eliminate that entire branch of Kindred. Th there was no fight at this point. He was just there announcing his intentions. Then he left. Very odd individual. One night before they opened the club, they went to a bar that had been recommended named The Purgatory. Now, those who know D.C., of course, have heard of Purgatory, infamous Anarch Bar. When they arrived, they met Velvet, current head of the Anarchs, Emilio, her child, I can't say head of much of anything. Of course, there were other kindred there, Art, who's there quite often, Tabitha. It was during this scene that Emilio slipped out to make a phone call and Quartermain, being who he is, snuck that out to listen, to hear what Emilio had to say. While this was happening, of course, Lily having a talk with Tabitha and her manipulating Toradora ways got Tabitha, Tabitha to admit she's Locke's sire, but had sired her without permission. Very bad thing for a Camarilla city. For it was Camarilla at the time. When they went to leave, they hopped in the SUV, started driving off, and noticed they were being followed. Followed by a van. Of course, being kindred, they're used to these kind of games. So they pulled over in a nice, appropriately masquerade-friendly place and dealt with the obvious ambush. At the time, they thought Emilio was behind it, based on a conversation that Quartermain had heard, and where they were waiting, and the gang members involved, though things would change at a later point. So here we were on the opening night. Locke had a sire that was avoiding her, because if Camarilla would find out, they would both be destroyed. They hadn't met any of the other clans other than a handful of Nosferatu, two Gangrel, three if you count the child Melissa, two Bruja, and a Pontifex, who they'd just heard rumors about was missing. 
So, opening co night comes along, and it was a moderate success in some ways, and others it wasn't. They met a lot more kindred. Lily found out the current head of the Torador, one Chaz Voyager. What is it about Chaz for a name? He was somewhat upset that Lily had come and opened a succubus club and was stealing things. You could tell he was bitter, though any declarations of, you know, war against her hadn't been declared. But you could tell he did not like any of this happening. They met Piter and Angelique, a Tremere and Torador in love, disapproved by both clans. The Tremere for daring to have a Torador in love with one of them, and the Torador for daring to love a Tremere. It's odd that that rivalry goes back beyond DC. It's always the tower again. Cassandra got to meet the Kaitif. Cassandra, a very old school Malkavian, taught him a lesson using entrancement. A lesson I don't think Steve forgot or he will ever forget at this point. The rest of the night went off pretty well, except for one small incident. After talking to Tabitha and attempting to see if Emilio might be behind the ambush, Tabitha, in an odd urge, told Emilio that they had been asking, which caused a confrontation. Emilio and his sire, Emilio denying it, the coterie saying, well, the evidence kind of suggests it, Velvet defending her child, Emilio almost, almost frenzying, if not held back by his sire. It was at that point that Velvet announced she would not be back. And they were no longer on the same sides. Once this was done, the rest of the club went that night. We won't detail all the other vampires. You'll meet them, trust me. Shortly after the opening, they found Locke found, actually, not they, Locke will give her credit there. Locke, while doing her standard patrols around the neighborhood looking for people up to no good, found reference to some people talking about a drug named Drop. Yes, I'll admit, I did steal that from Jason Carl. Modified it a little, but it's a great idea. So, a lot, not wanting, you know, heavy, massive drug use in the area, grabbed one of the pills and brought it back to the club and could smell the kindred on the, on the pill. Very upsetting. So they searched, and they located an old building that was townhouse style, where a guy was sitting out front, and people would walk up, and he'd hand them a pill, and they'd walk off, and another person would run up, and he'd open the mail slot and get a pill. They weren't even charging for this particular drug, being handed away free. Well, obviously, the coterie did not like this in their domain. Can't have that. Certainly not some unknown person handing out drugs, drugs of this type, mixing kindred blood. So while Locke and Lily dealt with the doorman, Quartermain and Steve Perry went in through the roof in the back. When they finally got in, they had made a bit of noise breaking through the door, and the person inside had got away, but what they found disturbed them. Woman strapped to a table with blood machines and blood bags hooked up and transfusion equipment. They were pulling drugs or blood out of her body and using it for some sort of thing. And the building apartments above them were full of people in various states of unconsciousness that were being rotated in and out to create this drug. Yeah, it was bad. Questioning the doorman only got them the information about it was a little girl, is what they were told. But a later meeting revealed it to actually not be a kid, but a kindred thin blood midget that somehow managed to escape not only them, but a lupine who happens to be allied with Nathan, who was in the area and caught a scent of what was going on. At this point, the Coterie found themselves with a thin blood problem. 
drugs being distributed in their domain. They never, they didn't catch the one who did it. A brewing war with the Bruja, though only two remained. They were still much more established than the Coterie. And it was at this point where a very odd thing also happened. They were met by Piter. The Tremere came to see Lily and asked if he had seen Angelique, the one he loved. She had turned up missing. Of course, Piter blamed his own clan, the Tremere, for taking her. The Torador, Chaz, who thought he was in charge of things, but wasn't as in charge as he thought, felt the Tremere had done it and blamed the Tremere, so it looked like a Torador and Tremere war. The Coterie began to get a little suspicious, though, but they had no proof of anything. Why would they have a thin blood issue, a random high-gen orphan show up, Angelique taken, war started, all of this in a short frame of time. It was almost as if somebody was planning to destabilize the entire city. It was when investigating, they found that Emilio, they found he had a rather large amount of weapons stashed up with some gangs. And I mean military-grade equipment. It seems good boy Emilio had been building armies in each of the four sections of D.C. in almost barrack-like areas, equipping them for war. The Coterie, knowing this is not something they should be part of, obviously went straight to Vital. Well, Karina, his Sinshaw, close enough. Vital was not pleased. Elysium was called to have everyone there. And when they arrived, they found Vital was, I think, less than pleased is the wrong description. Vitel does not tolerate those kinds of threats in his domain. Emilio was given the final death by beheading in front of all the assembled kindred. Killed because of the coterie. And that left Velvet. Right after they, Emilio was killed, though, Black Spiral Dancers actually attacked the Elysium, which was a Smithsonian building. Bad business there. The Coterie narrowly escaped, but it was bad. The one suspected behind it, Malik, the gangrel, in league with Black Spiral Dancers. Very odd combination of people. But as they were told by Mother, the head of the Lupines, who have an alliance with Nathan of the Nosferatu, told Coterie, Mother said, he doesn't smell right, even for an, a kindred. Something is odd about this individual. Could it be corruption, the worm, possession? We don't know yet. We will come to that. Maybe eventually, maybe not. All this little bits adding up and a few things we haven't discussed finally triggered something. That, and of course, a vision from Lily. What was triggered was they realized who they think was behind it. Nathan, of all people. The spy master for Vitel, Trusted friend of Portemain. Nathan had been setting the coterie up to put them into this war. And had been orchestrating some events. For he was the only one who had enough info to have given out everything that seemed to have happened. So the coterie decided big rewards take big risks. They were going to confront Nathan. And tell him they want in on it. Okay, that's ballsy. Even for Kindred. But they did. They went to Nathan, sat right down in front of him, the whole coterie, even Lily the Torador down in the sewers, and told Nathan that, you know, we know what you've been doing. We want in. It was at this point that Nathan explained there's going to be two choices here. We will come to an agreement or none of you leave the room. You will all meet the final death. Present at the meeting was, of course, the other Nosferatu came. Glenn, a rather psychotic Nosferatu, the hatchet man for Nathan. George, leader of the Rat Patrol, who 
one one of the three who ran it. That was the Rat Information Network. Amos, obsessed with humans who are alive. The people person that fed to Nathan. And then out of a door came the surprise. Stanford Warwick, former prince of Rhode Island. He had been missing since he lost his princedom. Apparently we found where he was, in D.C. He told them that this was all part of his bid to take back D.C. for the Camarilla. Because the Camarilla could not allow it to remain independent. Could not forgive what Vitell had done by making them look stupid, claiming to be Ventru when he was not. They didn't care if he returned. They bided their time. And the city was going to be retaken. The plan involved, of course, destabilizing his rules, thin bloods, running amok. Un, you know, controlled orphan vampires running amok. The war between the Coterie and the Bruja, mainly to get rid of all the potential Anarchs. A war between Tordor and Tremere. All of this to make Vitell look weak and inefficient to sway things on Stanford's side. Now, Quartermain, when he found out who was behind this, Warwick, descendant of Trajan himself, founder of the Shreknek. Quartermain was behind it 100%. Lily saw it as opportunity, a chance to be something else, to grab her ambition. She took it. Locke, oddly enough, Locke just wanted purgatory, a bar that she could call her own. But I guess for Locke not having anything for so long, that's really what she wanted, something of her own. Steve wanted the recognition he had been denied. For Steve was the odd one. His sire would stake him as a form of babysitting if his sire did not wish to deal with him at the moment. He staked Steve Perry and left him. And when he came back, he would unstake him like nothing had gone wrong. Steve wanted to never be put like that again, ever. Who was on Stanford's side? Well, the Coterie, the other Nosferatu, of course, and the new Pontifex, Veloes Sang. Yes, from Montreal. He was here. You see, when the previous Pontifex went missing, Cone declared himself Pontifex without checking with the actual pyramid or what's left of it. They were not happy. So, Veloes was sent to take it, Pontifex, and to properly chastise the upstart who claimed that title. So at this point, deals were made. Continue the plan that was going with the destabilization. Though Nathan did agree to back the thin blood off in their domain. No more thin bloods running drop in the Coterie's domain. The rest of the city was still fair game. And the first action was, they must kill Velvet. This leads to a very interesting story, one of our favorites, I think. Quartermain, being the Nosferatu, was very good at getting into areas where Velvet was, and he noticed that they didn't check the trunk of her vehicle when she went out every Wednesday night to meet with somebody. It was the only time she left her house, her, her well-defended, well, defended by gang members, Haven. Noticed they didn't check the trunk. So after hiding in there one night to find out where she went, he returned another night with a bomb. Now, the bomb was made by Steve Perry, who's not the best at explosives. Um, he failed the role, and I gave him a succeed at a cost that involves, he doesn't know how big it is till it detonates. But I gave the indication it was a heavy backpack. And while Quartermain asked, is this sure this is enough? I, uh, the response was, yeah, I think so. So they put this backpack in her trunk of her car, waited for her to leave, and then proceeded to blow a 70 meter explosion radius fireball from what used to be a Bruja. Bruja go boom, or as we call it, Bruja salsa. It blew bits of Bruja in more places than you would ever believe. 
but they succeeded. Now, of course, this is a little bit high profile, but they felt they could explain it as a manhole explosion, which happens in D.C. quite a bit, actually. Uh, little did they know they had an ally who was helping suppress the masquerade breach portions of this one. So you have Velvet dead, Emilio dead, the Anarch movement dead in D.C. Thin Blood's taking over. For the Pontifex, he wanted Piter dead, which led to an interesting problem. Angelique, we found where he, she was, Nathan, had taken her to pull her out to start the war. But Lily wanted Angelique back. Lily knew that Angelique's in love with Piter. If we convince Piter to leave town, Angelique will leave with him. But if Piter stays in town, the Tremere will kill him probably get Angelique killed as well. So Lily, being the ambitious one, decided what she would do was before Angelique got woke from torpor and rescued, she would claim she's getting Piter to safety and arrange an ambush from the Pontifex to take Piter from them so that she could tell Angelique, we tried, but the Pontifex was too much for us. Of course, the Pontifex wouldn't reveal his role in this because what Tremere wants to admit that to get a rebel member of his own chantry, he had to resort to a Torridor helping him. So that was their plan. The Thin Bloods are running around, getting people drugged up, almost ghoul-like from this drop. Dangerous combination. So... One day, after hearing of an ATF raid on their place from the explosion, they moved all the stuff that was evidence into Quartermain's hidden area. Quartermain found a door that was not there before. There was no door before, but it was opened. So him and Locke went to explore the labyrinth under Quartermain's domain. While there, they found a very odd room. And it was a beautiful black-haired woman asleep in a luxurious bedroom that should not be located under DuPont Circle. And when they entered the room, they could feel the waves of hate emanating off, pushing and shoving, and they fled from the room. Beast, for once, was not coherent. It was gibbering and jabbering and almost unrecognizable in speech to get away from that monster in that room. So, they went and took it to Stanford because this was a major issue. Stanford, by the description and things that he had heard and rumors, believed he knew who it was. Sybil, child of La Sombra himself. And also, Sybil was Vitel's sire hidden underneath D.C. for these many centuries, Methuselah of the fourth generation, living under D.C. in a labyrinth. What could they do? I think the initial decision was, we'll just ignore she's down there for now. If she don't wake up, we'll be happy. The Thin Bloods, it was decided it was time to kill the midget providing all of the blood, the drop blood. The idea was all the junkies would hit withdrawal. And then withdraw as they are ghoul pluses, not or ghoul lights, I should say. Human plus ghoul light. They're in between the two. Junkies addicted, stronger than normal humans, less powerful than ghouls, would riot when they hit the withdrawal effects in 30 days. That went off without a hitch for the killing, other than it did cost Mr. Steve Perry his sixth point of humanity. He is now at five. I'm not going to go into the disturbing details of that kill. Suffice it to say, she was an innocent. Had no role. Should not have been involved in this. Shouldn't have been killed. But Steve had a goal, and his goal was to get the power to never be treated like he was 
by Cassandra and his own sire. He didn't hesitate. At the cost of his own humanity, he did not hesitate. So they knew in 30 days the riots would begin. And that happened to fall on July 4th. For those who have not been to D.C., it's bad on the 4th of July. It's busy. Tourists from everywhere are here. To have a riot caused by junked up human plus almost ghouls feeming for a drug they can't get anymore because the one who supplied it is dead is a massive problem. It was at this point that they found out that Vitell wanted to have another meeting of all kindred in Elysium. Nobody knew why. Even Karina didn't know why. His own Sin Chow. Nathan, his spymaster, did not know why. And when they arrived, it was just all the kindred at the Jefferson Memorial of all places, gathered around. Steve found his sire was in D.C., a man named Dr. Jeffrey Granger, who was also Ludlow's sire, though they didn't have time to talk then. It was at this point that Vitel appeared. Everyone didn't know what to have. But Vitel gave a speech. And I'm actually going to read this speech because it explains a lot. And though Locke and Lily haven't heard it from Quartermain or Steve yet, but Locke and Larry, Lily like to claim Vitel flounced out of D.C. A fifth generation Lysambra flouncing. Not quite sure that's applicable, but that's what they claim. His speech was, and there it is. When I awoke underneath D.C. 64 years ago, I admit I approached D.C. and his fellow kindred with less than noble designs. It was ambition that drove him, which is the ambition of what his clan was, I guess. He paid for his crimes with death at the hands of Theo Bell. When I managed to drive myself from the beyond, I realized I had been a pawn of other pawns all along. And I vowed to never again be caught up in all that epic and eternal struggle again. So he returned to D.C. and with Theo's help, Theo, Bell, and Beckett's help, he took the city back from the Sabbat. His plan was to create, or he said my plan was to create, a place for all these kindred. Anarch, Sabbat, Camarilla, Independence, to live together without that influence. The only thing I asked was to follow his rules, uphold the masquerade, not to sire any children because of the Inquisition, and to acknowledge his leadership. His version of his laws was not overly harsh. He said, I, I have not ruled heavy. My hand was not hard on your necks. I left you free from interference to live the way you want. Not even the Anarch Barons rule as lightly as I did. And what do I get for my trouble and my lenience? Betrayal from those I trust, those I have tried to protect. I suppose that is the nature of our kind. Do you think death made me so weak and blind I do not see what is being planned in my city? Do you think I do not know what you have done? I once told Theo Bell that I would not let the streets of my city run and be drowned in blood ever again, and I meant it. I guess it's fitting that we are at this meeting where I betrayed Marissa, the former prince, so long ago. The tower is set in motion plans that will cause a tsunami of blood the city has never seen. But it will not be upon my shoulders the burden will fall. It will be upon yours. For I will not be your Caesar, and you will not be my Brutus. I, Lucius Aelius Sejournus, child of Sybil of Clan Lasambra, hereby leave this city to you. May you rot in the disaster you have created. And he left in a cloud of darkness, taking Nathan, spymaster, 
the one he trusted in many ways the most. Quartermain's mentor. All that was left behind was the locket that he was always wearing. A locket that had, oddly enough, a picture of the previous prince, Marissa, and the woman that Quartermain and Locke had seen under the city, Sybil. Very odd thing for him to have carried around, never replacing Marissa's picture. Wore it for years. It was at this point, they immediately had a meeting with Stanford. Stanford was going to declare praxis now, for Vitell had left. The Thin Bloods were now their problem. I guess they were too clever, or at least Stanford and Nathan were too clever for their own good, because now they had to deal with the Thin Blood menace that they created. The riots were on them, not on Vitell anymore. They lost Nathan's knowledge, all the intelligence he had gathered over the years, gone. Leaving Stanford with Lily Sanger, Harold, for Prince Stanford. Primogen of the Torador now. Steve Perry, Kaitif, to be named Primogen of the Clanless. An unprecedented move in D.C. To have a Primogen of a Kaitif in charge of the Clanless and the Thin Bloods. Quartermain to be declared Sheriff of D.C. Locke declared his hound. Also, Steve Perry not wanting to deal with Thin Bloods and Locke caring about those who have been left outside of society, became the whip, or to be the whip, of the clanless primogen, the Kaitif primogen. So, that's an odd situation. You have a Kaitif primogen with a gangrel whip who's also hound. It's an interesting combination. Scourge was named Victoria of Clan Lasambra. Very odd Lasambra. She likes to leave by saying, Toodles. Very odd. Though, as protege of Tally. Yes, Tally himself. So obviously very good at what she'd done. It was at this point, after they'd announced the praxis, that the memorandum was played. And that was B. Dave's Patreon game he ran for us, where they relived the night they fled to D.C. And the reason I bring it up again was it was a rather important part. And B. Dave did a wonderful job with it because when we came back from the memorandum, we had new lines to go. Steve Perry was remembered, wait a minute, he called himself Jimmy Page in L.A. We knew him. And he's like, well, yeah, but Jimmy's dead because he had killed that personality as he came here. They realized that Steve Perry, though Kaitif, his sire's Malkavian, he is a failed Malkavian. Malkavian who didn't get the full curse of the blood, but no one could call Steve Perry sane. Locke, on the other hand, met, thought of that Lilith, who talked of the Dark Mother and pain, suffering, being the path to enlightenment, belonging in family. Locke woke from the memorandum with a voice in her head who spoke to her in a dream. The voice said, young one, such strong dreams, so much strength in him, and dreams of the dark mother. This voice offered Locke family and companionship, said her what she wants could be achieved, but to remember that the path is always through suffering. And at first Locke kept it to herself because kindred don't want to hear someone else's voice, a voice they don't recognize in their head. But that's what happened. And for a while she managed to keep it hidden. Until the day that she had one last discussion where mother said that she would give her everything she wants if she would help her. And Locke felt pain in her dream. And when she woke, she had a mark on her arm. Three symbols when looked at since the unseen. One they identified right away, the symbol of Lilith. One they found later 
the symbol of the ancient La Sombra. The third symbol took quite a bit longer, but turned out to be the symbol of death. After the mark was on her arm, Locke started hearing that same voice during her waking time, at night, talking to her, offering help, taunting her. It was almost like the beast, but not. Locke, of course, warned the coterie, because even Locke knew this was too much. The coterie were torn. Quartermain wanted to tell Stanford, because potentially his hound is compromised. Lily's loyalty, of course, was to Locke, and wanted to make sure that Locke was safe and knew to tell Stanford was to condemn Locke to death. Finally, Quartermain decided to keep the secret for now, and to just watch Locke. As long as she did not act differently, they would let it go. It was after the night that they went to get Piter for the ambush that got him murdered in cold blood in the middle of the street in front of Lily and Locke that the voice got stronger. A few days later, Locke was asked to do something. We'll come to that very shortly. For in between that time, somebody declared Praxis as well. Someone made a challenging Praxis against Stanford. There was a man who called himself Felix, Felix LaRue, Harold. There was Vanessa Cruz, who declared herself Prince, Torador. A gangrel as sheriff named Josephine King. Stanford was worried at this one. A Torador prince being declared? Will Lily turn on him? Will Lily abandon the Nosferatu prince for one of her own clan? His worries were not founded in reality on this, but Stanford is paranoid. Lily wouldn't turn on him. Her deal was too good. What could a Torador prince give her when she's already Harold and Primogen? Most of the time, you don't have primogen of the same clan as the prince. So, what could she gain? Nothing. It was then that one of the members of this new court, was an Osferatu, appeared in the club and said he knew of Stanford. He had lived in Rhode Island. His name was Stephen. Rather unimportant Nosferatu. But he announced he was not going to be part of that counter praxis because he knew Stanford's reputation. He was not going to get in the way of Stanford taking what he wanted because he knew what would happen. And he told the coterie that he could get Felix, the herald of the Torador, to back off, to step aside, provided they could make a show of power enough to show that Vanessa had no hope of winning. And the shine of power was going to be to murder the other sheriff. Which the coterie accomplished in a roundabout way. Well, not murdered, but discredited. For you see, that sheriff was more than a match for him. Being the typical brute gangrel of an older generation. She held out fine four on one. Barely. With the help of an odd artifact. The chains of Athena. As they were told by the Pontifex. But they also found that this sheriff was in league, or at least talking with the Second Inquisition. Very bad thing in D.C., there being a headquarters. So, that alone should be enough to prevent the other praxis from going through. It was on this same night that Locke was told by the voice that if she did a favor for the voice in her head, small thing, she would leave her alone for a while and let her rest. And because the voice was tired, needed sleep. It was a simple thing. Go to a house in D.C. Locke didn't know the address, but she knew where it was. Lift up a floorboard. Pull what was found under the floorboard out and throw it in the river. Now, of course, when Locke mentioned that, she told the Coterie and Quartermain said, no, we're not doing that. The moment Quartermain left their sight, 
to go work on copying a very interesting book they had borrowed. I'll leave that for the game, the book. Soon as they left Quartermain's sight, Steve Perry's like, let's go get it. Locke's like, let's go get it. Lily's like, whatever, if you, that's what you're going to do. At least I'm going to go with you to supervise. Because Steve Perry is anything but responsible. At five humanity, he goes along with any plan, as long as he's going to survive. So they went to this house and found a ring, an amethyst ring. Didn't look very valuable. But Locke did what she was told. She took it to the river and threw it in. And when it hit the water, the water glowed blue where it hit, and it sunk beneath the waves. And she thought that was going to be the end of it. Might have been. Might not. Late that night, a visitor showed up to the coterie. It was just a normal courier. Just bringing a package. Unmarked had an address in Locke's name. Locke's like, well, who sends me packages? I don't, nobody sends me anything. Inside was a locket, a very familiar type of locket, engraved with the symbol of the gangrel clan on the front. And inside was Locke's picture and the black-haired woman sleeping under the city. It was almost identical to the necklace that Vitell had worn, except this one for Locke. And a voice said she's tired, but she'll be in touch. And the gift was left for Locke. And then Locke, she likes the locket. She don't get many gifts, but even she knows it's not something to be worn. So it is locked up in the safe of Lily, in a lockbox in the safe that only Lily and her chief ghoul has the code for Though Steve Perry has become awful interested in that locket, not even meant for him. He doesn't know why. He's drawn to it, pulls at him and tugs at him. So, where do we stand now? Where is the first session? The first session is going to involve Quartermain, who has to go speak with Dorian Adams. The Mad Ventru, who lives outside D.C., he thinks he's Dracula, not the Zemichi Dracula vampire, but Bram Stoker's Dracula or Leslie Nielsen's Dracula or whichever movie version his mind is currently locked on, version of Dracula. He cycles through them all. But Quartermain suspects he might have info on how to protect locks. There is also a meeting with one Art Morgan, brother of the gangrel Xavier. Art is a very old vampire who acts like a burnt out hippie now. Though recent developments have come to light that it may not be an act, but it may have been a choice that he had made to have something done to forget his past so that he could forget. But the new Torador prince that had declared Praxis was blackmailing Art with knowledge of Tabitha siring Locke. So the idea is that Locke is going to get Tabitha and Art together, force both of them to admit Art knows, and for Tabitha to admit that she is Locke's sire, and for Art to admit he's always known. And I believe Lily plans to spill some beans that Vitel had kept hidden. It's going to be a very interesting session because Art's fun to play for me. Some Coterie members don't like him, some like him, but he's a lot of fun. Dorian is crazier than a shithouse rat. He's going to be a lot of fun. Lily will not go visit him again. So join us next week on the 21st, where I will be back in the seat again with the guy liner, and we will run a game. But 9 p.m., no, sorry. 11 p.m. this Friday, 11 p.m. for sure, I'm going to run a short stream, talk about prepping for the game and storytelling for anyone who's interested. Because many of you, you know, I, I get questions a lot about storytelling. How do you set it up? How do you handle this? So we'll have a stream to talk about some storytelling, give some tips. You know, I'll, I'll look at the, the chat 
If anyone has any questions in chat, I'm available right now. I'm watching it. It's right here in front of me. But if that's it, that's where we are. The fun begins next week. Any questions there? Well, thank you. I, I, first time, you know, live like this, so. It's going to get crazy. Come on, Jim, I know you got a question. Locke's got a question. Is she going to get the final death, Tabitha? That's Locke's question, right? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. The stream will be archived for 60 days, for sure, because of Twitch. Uh, I may transfer it to YouTube at some point when it's close to the 60 days, but I think we can do a, a write-up. You haven't won Praxis yet, but it's close enough. Uh, with their, her sheriff discredited and hiding, wounded, uh, you're going to just break the art blackmail ring. That pretty much leaves her without support. That will end her Praxis. I know lack and fear, or I know lack and fear is Quartermain. Quartermain, you have lots of questions. You want to know what was done to Art? Will you get to get revenge? Uh, you know, can, can Dorian help? What's going on in your labyrinth? Can Zelios help? You got lots of questions. Yeah, you, you'll win the Praxis if you manage to convince Art to not back the other one, break the blackmail. Uh, the mo other only influential ones, powerful vampires, other than Art, was Cassandra, who she backed the wrong side, and you know what's going to happen to her. And then the Rachel thing that will be brought up. It's been an interesting game. We're 15 sessions in. There's a lot of stuff I didn't bring up, because if I tried to talk at all, we would be here for two hours, three hours, four hours, just talking what went on. It has been a wild ride of a sessions for everybody. Ups and downs and crazy shit and betrayals and double backs and stabs. And I mean, your, the Kai Tief has gone from seven to five humanity already. And he's on a rocket train right down to the bottom. Quartermain is king of not using or not having to, you know, feed. He manages his blood like a boss. Though he finally, you know, had a stain, though he succeeded and didn't lose his humanity. Do we have any house rules? Um, I don't use the willpower uh, social damage. So in social situations, I don't make them take damage from willpower when they're doing social contests. Uh, the role, the 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 rules for social contests, it's played by the role play. Uh, you can tell if someone's lost status. You don't need to keep track on your willpower track. Your status is tracked by the way the game is. Um, other than that, we do use the refresh all willpower rule that's mentioned basic, briefly in the book. Uh, each session, I give them all their roll power back because I'm notorious for making them roll wits awareness anytime they go in a car to ride anywhere. Because if I only had them roll it when they're being followed, they'll know they're being followed by having to roll. So I make them roll it. So um, other than that, I mean, I'm thinking of the other house rules. The resonances, I count the resonance if they have the right temperament as a bonus dot without any extra, you know, ability, so they don't get a new discipline, but it counts their discipline as one dot higher. It makes the resonance is more important. Uh, it makes it uh, something more sought after at times. Um, yeah, we don't use the beast, bestial failure house rule. Yeah, if you get a single bestial failure and the roll itself was a failure, that's bestial failure. Even if you got two successes, if you needed three to do it, and you had two successes and a bestial skull, that's a bestial failure. Though on passive skills, I don't apply it normally because, you know, just like messy criticals, I don't always apply them on passives. But an active, yeah, it gets rough. We've had a few bestials. Uh, if anyone else can think of anything I've, I've house ruled, I'm trying to think of any other major house rules we've used. Um, my session zero is very different. It's very unique. I may talk about that bit on bit next week for the storytelling session uh, just discuss how it's done because it's not the standard uh, session zero but it creates much more fleshed out characters in terms of knowing your backstory and who you are and what you're doing uh, so th but that's a session unto itself almost or, or a stream on itself 
It's one I developed long ago from a mistake in the book. Uh, we use uh, the simplified combat. We don't use uh, more of the advanced other than grapple rules for uh, Locke because Locke specializes in grapple. Got to let her do her grapple thing. Um, but I think that's about it for the house rules. I'm not big on too many. Um, XP's awarded one XP per hour of, of time at the table. Seems to work pretty well for our group. It's still more than what they recommend in the book, but if I tried to give my players one to two experience a session, uh, my wife would be first in line to stab me uh, because that's just not enough XP. They'd never go get anywhere. So, you know, I will say from, from the story perspective, the lore sheets have been great. Um, getting the five dots in the Succubus Club, it's great for story purposes. It gives a central place. Everyone meets. It's a high visibility target, which means I can always put Kindred visiting. Uh, of course, it's a target for being attacked. That's why Quartermain goes to his labyrinth that he doesn't let people really see much. Uh, but it makes some great story there because it gives something other Kindred want to be there. It's a succubus club. They want to go there, you know, but it's a target. And it gives a nice central place for the story. Uh, the Zelios lore sheet is amazing if you're talking Nosferatu story. Uh, we play every other week for six hours. Now, the plan is we're going to stream three hours of each session live right on Twitch. The other three hours will be recorded and played on Twitch with us live in the chat to interact. That way, it'll be played on the following weeks. That way, we're every week live with a three-hour stream, uh, which consists of the first half of our game, and then the second part of the stream is the second half of our game that wasn't live. That way, we can actually interact with the audience every other stream because we won't be able to interact while we're playing. We can't because we're playing. You know, I'm not going to look at the screen when I'm playing. But, yeah, this way we can interact with everybody. It's important to get that interaction. You know, and I'm looking at maybe a Friday night stream to talk about storytelling or plans for the weekend. Or one thing Jason Carl, I talked to him once uh, on Twitter about was, I was curious about how things could have gone based on a die roll. For Actually, it was the epilogue for Nelly G this season. And I asked him, well, what if the role he had succeeded, one of the characters had succeeded role, how would you have done the screen? The scene and he told me how he'd done it and it brought to mind that so few times do storytellers have discussions about how they would have handled a scene if it went differently than what people have seen or the players have done how could you have done it if the player had made this role or failed at this role or done this so i would love to see a scene from or a discussion on you know how i handle if if the kids coterie had done something totally different than i planned or uh, they'd failed a role how would the story have branched or could it have gone differently? And I think that's something that a lot of storytellers would like to see. Yeah, you didn't intend to steal from Jasper. You didn't expect a full labyrinth. But uh, between that one and the memoriam Jason Carl did about Zelios going, around, Zelios going around creating labyrinths, it made sense for DC to have one. There's a Karn in Rock Creek Park where the Lupine live. That's from the book. So if there's a Karn over there, of course, there, a ley line would be through there. And if you do a ley line, well, then you go Zelios because it makes sense. It's great. Good story. It's not quite like Jasper's. It's different. Uh, yours is much newer than Jasper's. Uh, Jasper's has been there, much, you know, it's finished. Yours is not. So the Quartermain Labyrinth is still in development. So shit changes a lot more than Jasper's. So, you know, I do Bogart some stuff from Jason Carl, The Drop. I loved it. It was a great idea. It's great for story. Um... You know, I pulled that in. So, I don't mind it. I admit, uh, there were some good ideas that I got from some of the Roll For It guys with their Sounds of Silence season that I changed enough to not just be blatant ripoffs, but some good story ideas and story hooks that I liked. So, I adapted them to my own game, changed them a bit, and made them part of our story. And that's the best thing about storytelling and why I want to share this uh, on the net is because I want my fellow players and storytellers out there to see it, get some ideas. Maybe they incorporate it into their game. That's how the game grows and that's how the stories grow. I get better seeing other people play and other people run things and maybe somebody can learn something from me. So, anyone else got some good questions? Or not good questions? Hey, you got a bad question, ask me one. Yes, I'm wearing guy liner. That's a good question. That's a bad question. So you can ask that. <laughs> you know, it's... This is the slower stream. Next week is going to be the full game, though, so watch out. It's going to be interesting. We'll see who 
who wears a mask on their face, who doesn't. Um, we'll see if uh, Quartermain tells Lily she's giving somebody a chub. That gets said quite a bit. Um, we'll see uh, Locke maybe say, damn, girl, when, when Lily stabs somebody cold-heartedly and murders them. Um, yeah. Um, Steve Perry's going to roll the worst rolls magical. Every time Steve Perry ga- grabs his dice, you will see he's going to roll horribly. Period. It's bad. Doing any behind the scenes? Yes, yes. I do want to do some behind the st- scenes stuff. Uh, uh, I want to do some behind the Chronicle. Like I said, the Friday thing is going to be... There's a lot of work put into making DC V5, but some also behind the scenes stuff. If you want to know about the stream setups that I've gone through, that's cool. I'm down with that. Yeah, sorry, uh, Gehenna. I've got it not to allow a bunch of... a uh, bunch of spamming uh, symbols because it drives me crazy. It's one of those personal OCD twitch things that does me. I like start twitching. I can't deal with it. <laughs> but thanks for the host, Gehenna. I'm glad to see you made it. Uh, just, you know, maybe request someone to put on a mask. You may, um, but I'm not going to wear a mask because I've got to be able to see the dice and I'm blind enough as it is. Um, I mean, you can ask Lance to put on a mask. Steve Perry over there, he'll, he'll put on a mask. But, um, I mean, is it going to be an improvement? I mean, really? It's going to be an improvement? Uh, Quartermain's going to wear the mask. I'm not sure why he is, but he chooses to. That's fine. It'll be pretty crazy stuff. Um, you know, I, hey, I understand. Get, again, again, you can be late. You got the video on demand. You can watch it. I've went through a lot of what went on. Um, there'll be some things I didn't reveal that we'll discuss while we're playing because you'll hear it come up. Uh, this session's going to be crazy. There's some interesting, um, as uh, Locke would say, um, Dumpster fire stuff going on because Locke is about to be put in charge of her own sire. So her own sire is going to have to be reporting as a child to Locke uh, with the same thing as the normal sire child thing where until Locke feels her sire child is fit for Camarilla society, Locke has full reign of destruction on her. Lily is going to steal the child of Chaz Voyager, uh, her rival because his child is backing the other Praxis. So that Lily is going to take his child and force her through a blood bond at the command of Stanford to um, be reintroduced. Uh, because obviously Cone cannot control, or Chaz, see I did it, there's one, I did it. Chaz cannot control his own child. I did it, yep, shut, I can hear laughing through the floor. I have a bad problem. I'm going to warn people. I say wrong names. I think the right name, but say the wrong one, and I do it with colors. You'll hear it. So Chaz and Cone get mixed up a lot until I'm corrected, and they will correct me. Um, if there's any other questions, or I mean, I'm glad you people who joined me did it. Uh, you know, it was my first time. I've never done this before. Yes, my brain is broke. That is correct. Thank you, lack and fear. Um, it's just something we've been wanting to do for a while, me and uh, Relin. Um, Lack and fear was a quarter main. He was a little more hesitant. Locke was like, whatever, we're good. Um, I just, all, you know, wanted to share the games. I think they're fun. We have too much fun to not share. And I know uh, Kellador, who's in the channel, I've already been talking to him. Um, he's already got a guest appearance we're going to plan out for one of his characters to show up in the DC Chronicle on stream one night. Um, there'll be others I may speak with about possibly showing up from time to time as guest appearances. Uh, I know at one point B. Dave and May leave and said that they'd be willing to discuss guest appearances. Uh, of course, B. Dave can't be any of his, uh, can, his characters can into the LA by night directly because that is a geek and sundry and, and white wolf. But I've got lots of characters he can play for a night if he wants to pop in the stream. We can do that because I enjoy playing with them. It's fun games. So, no other questions? Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you showed up, you know. Um, see you next Friday for those who want to hear a little bit on storytelling. It would be 11 p.m. Eastern time since, you know, L.A. by night's over for the season. I can use that slot for now. Uh, 
but it'll, we'll talk about storytelling in session zero and how I approached converting and how I go about running a vampire game. You'll find out just how much I improvise and how much I plan ahead. Uh, the answer is kind of surprising, really. Um, that's a big one. Yeah, the season one, that's going to be interesting. Uh, yeah, he's always on the jazz. Thank, thank you, uh, Quartermain. Thank you, Ed. I enjoy storytelling. I love playing. Uh, it's fun. It gives me something to get my mind off things. And it lets me improvise in a lot of ways and, and, and have fun with my friends. So I will call it a stream then. Thank you for coming. And look, I even got a nice little outro done. Ready?